I don't know, man, life's such a complicated, difficult thing, you know, it's, aren't we all looking for that one thing that we can sort of justify our existence with? Skyrim. Skyrim, <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Camel. The man behind the camera is my good friend, Jack Hutto. If you want to work with him, link down below. We were lucky enough to have been invited down here to Canberra, Australia's capital city, to the National Film and Sound Archive for the Game Masters exhibition. Just a few months ago within Australia, gaming has been officially recognized as a relevant art and media medium worth archiving and celebrating. To welcome it to the National Film and Sound Archive, the NFSA have created this awesome historical exhibition running from now until March 2020. It's definitely worth a visit if you're keen on gaming or if you want to see Australia's own gaming industry talent deliver intriguing presentations about the industry in Australia and in general. This video comes to you with great thanks to the NFSA for bringing us down to Canberra, Reboot PR for organising this meeting and the Overlo Nishi Hotel for putting us up. We're down here to have a chat with the man, the myth, the legend himself, Australia's own herald of sonic energy, Mick Gordon. Mick is a globally celebrated game music composer, known for his work on the soundtracks of the Need for Speed franchise, Killer Instinct, Wolfenstein The New Order, Wolfenstein The Old Blood, Wolfenstein The New Colossus, Prey, and of course 2016's Doom soundtrack, which at the Game Awards he actually won Best Music and Sound Design for along with an array of other awards along the way and following. And for the last two years, he's been working on 2020's Doom Eternal soundtrack. Now, along with being extremely talented, Mick is a genuinely lovely man and exceedingly interesting to talk to, and it was a genuine pleasure and honor to have an hour of his time. I hope you enjoy our interview, and at the start there, he was talking about Easter eggs and game development before we even got the cameras on, so little bonus footage there. Anyway, I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. I can tell you, like, from the development side that it's always really super rewarding when somebody finds that stuff because the grand truth about Let's go. Let's go. the grand truth about like game development is this is actually really boring a lot of the time like you know it's like cooking dinner for example like you might think that you know you get this concept of having a big dinner right and you like plan out this whole meal and it's all very exciting you get your guests and all that sort of stuff but then a lot of it is just peeling potatoes you know, it's just that stuff and that's Washing it. dishes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And then through that boredom, you might go, oh, I might put a little message on that or I might hide something there or whatever. And it's most of the time out of boredom. There's not a team that sits down and goes, right, where are we going to put Easter eggs in? Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. And so when somebody like yourself finds it and then like so dedicated makes hour long plus videos about it, that's when it's like super rewarding. It's interesting how many devs message me like, I didn't know, yeah. that, I didn't know that existed. <laughs> yeah, that too. All right, Mick, thank you so yeah, much cheers, for joining us today. First of all, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm quite well. Right. For someone that's been in the industry so long like yourself, is having it recognized at a place like the National Archive of Film and Sounds rewarding for you, like the gaming industry being recognized seriously? It's so weird even like you're saying, been in for so long because walking around here, you really do get a sense of the history of the games. Like there's an original Pac-Man machine here. That's older than me, you know what I mean? And so like walking around the exhibition, I can almost point to the point where like I started and thankfully it's still kind of near the end of the exhibition, um, which is good actually, because it means I'm not that old. Um, but I don't know, it's to, I mean, like, to see anything like this is incredible, really. And I think this exhibition in particular does such a good job of showing the history of games, to go from these old ancient arcade machines right up to modern stuff, and the progression of in between that, that's huge. It looks really, really impressive. And are you proud of yourself to be like asked to present or something like this? I don't, I don't even, like, I, I don't think of it like that. I think of it as a great privilege and an honor, honestly. Oh, awesome. Um, I, I, I wouldn't even consider it anything else than that. Like. Down here in Australia, the honest truth is that we're pretty isolated for the best of the time, right? Um, big land mass, small population, down at the bottom of the world, not a lot happens. And so when anything like this does happen, it's extraordinary. And when it happens at this level, that's amazing. And if they reach out and they say, hey, we'd love to have you involved, you want to come talk to some people, of course I'm going to do that. You know what I mean? Like, when I was starting out, I wasn't even really aware that so much amazing game stuff was done in Australia. The visibility at that time wasn't great. Even now, I'm rather unaware of what Australia's up to. Yeah, isn't it amazing? You probably have that same thing that I do, where it's like, this big game comes out, all of a sudden everybody's talking about it, right? Then you find out it was made in Australia. 
you know? And how many times has that happened over the last few years, you know? It was like one third down in Melbourne or something like that that made this amazing game that everybody's talking about, right? And that's happened so many times. So for me, this, this idea of visibility, you know, being out there showing people, yes, it's going on here, yes, this is the stuff, that's important. So yes, it's a great privilege and an honor. Do you wish exhibitions like this existed when you were getting into it? Yeah, I mean, honestly, like I said, I'm not gonna say anything, you know, bad about this sort of thing. It's incredible, are you serious? Like, it's amazing, <laughs> really. Um, I think, personally, I would imagine what it's being, like, imagine being eight years old, nine years old, and walking into a place like this, right? Your entire perspective of games is gonna be normalized. Like, this is a thing that belongs in museums. That argument of, is game art? Is it a lucrative career? Is it something that's even worth pursuing? Is, is irrelevant to somebody like that when they see this at such a young age. You and I see this for what it is, it's like a miraculous thing, right? The only museums and exhibitions that we would have seen when we were younger have paintings that are 100 plus years old. Great, awesome to celebrate that stuff, but what about the art from today? You know, is it gonna take 100 years to celebrate this? No, it's not, because we've got people like NFSA that are bringing this exhibition here, so yeah. What first comes to mind when I say musical influences for you? Oh, Jimi Hendrix, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> Hendrix, I still find myself actually when I'm working on some things and I'm like, you know what, I really need this, this thing, right? There's a voice in my head that says, Hendrix didn't need that thing. And so, yeah, no, it's still Hendrix, man. Hendrix, Hendrix. Wow, Hendrix. Yeah. I never knew yeah. that. Yeah, I totally. would have guessed that. I wouldn't have guessed that. I mean, if you think about like that time, so Hendrix over what, a four year period just blew people's minds. I mean, culminating in that Woodstock performance, which was done at what, eight o'clock in the morning or something like that on the fourth day. Woodstock at that point was considered like a national emergency. It was dreadful, but there was enough people that hung around to see that. That's rock and roll, man. That's way more metal than any metal thing I've ever seen. Um, the sounds, his approach to music, um, all that sort of stuff I still find mind-blowing. Where that came from, too, at that time. Do you know what I mean? Like, I feel now we're in a stage where things happen so quickly, but it's so easy to, to see the, the change and the progression of those things. So I can see the change from one genre until it becomes the next genre, until it becomes a genre after that. You can sort of see it gradually occur over a number of years. But for Hendrix coming out like 66, 67 with those sounds, I can't even put myself into that position, what that must have been like, you know? That's still inspiring to me, yeah. Yeah, awesome. That's sick you can still pull inspiration from that Oh stuff. yeah, of course, yeah. Uh, did you come from a musical family? Um, my grandfather is, like, he would be one that I would be in, in such a shadow, for, but I never met him, and that's what's amazing. And I've spent a good part of my life trying to understand who he was from stories that my mum had about him playing Mahler, Gustav Mahler, on the piano. And so he had a musical link there, but he was a Korea Air Force man, and he was highly decorated from World War II. He was awarded Order of the British Empire and then Commanding Order of the British Empire. He climbed his way up, he was extraordinary. Uh, I still have a bunch of his medals and things like that. But the things that he did back in the like, 30s, 40s and 50s, uh, I couldn't even put myself into that position now. That's pretty much the only musical link beyond my own father that I can see. My dad's always been into guitars and had guitars laying around. It was natural that I was going to pick up a guitar because there were so many around the house. It was 20 or whatever it would be just in the lounge room. So, yeah. Was there a particular moment where, like, that you remember where you went, I want, I want to do music for a living. I want this to be my life. Um, yeah, it was the moment when I realised I was terrible at everything else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, all I did in high school was, was play the guitar. I didn't do anything, I didn't pay attention. The teacher would be talking to me and my, my head would be going, like just, I'd be drawing guitars, I'd be, I'd have my like Walkman in listening to, you know, Led Zeppelin or something like that. I was just on a totally not engaged in school at all. And um, when I left school, I kind of realized how stupid that was. <laughs> Because I was uh, terrible at everything. It's still terrible at everything. It's exactly what I did with uh, uh, Mara Winds and Oblivion yeah. and Man's Sky. <laughs> I failed school because of work. Exactly. Like, like that, I need right? to make a career out of this. But like that, I think that's really what what passion is, right? Yeah, it's, it's like, like you're so interested in it. Yeah. yeah. And if you if you love it that much, you'll find a way to do it because that's the only answer. It's not like it was a choice. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I never sat down and go, you know what, well, I could go become a lawyer or I could do music. It was never that choice. It's always been music, always would be music. I wouldn't know what I'd do without music. 
probably be dead. I like, I really would not know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean though? It's yeah, like it's, it's, there's no question. Yeah. Do you have much music theory in you? Yes. Like, You're very familiar with that stuff? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And do you think that's really important to your work? Um, I don't know. I couldn't really answer for anybody else, honestly. Like, I, I, I do things the way I do. I, I don't know. I know there's lots of amazing people out there that make a career out of music that have no understanding of it all. Mm -hmm. um, I got into that stuff because when I was playing guitar, I found that the, the way that I'd learned to play guitar was restrictive because it was based on the the pattern way of playing guitar. So this pattern here is one key, and if you want a different key, you just shift that, and then you play exactly the same thing, but now you're in a different key. And I had a great teacher that came along and said, hey, I can put a key into that fretboard and unlock it so you know exactly what you're playing. And all of a sudden then, you're not just playing patterns that you've like mind-numbingly practiced over and over again, but you're now going to play with intention. You're going to want to play this particular note for this reason. And I guess I didn't really think about it too much at the time, but later on, especially now, that helps me so much because when we're sitting down to score a game, I don't even approach the computer until I have an intention in mind. So I'm going to the workstation to put this note down in this place, you know what I mean? And I already know about that beforehand. So yeah, in my mind, the theory is so important. So do you find it more like a creative thing or a technical thing? Do you like, do you come at it mathematically or like naturally? Ah, I wouldn't say it's mathematical. Yeah, it's okay. like certain things are mathematical, meaning that like, we might need to make a certain time limit, for example, like it might need to be 10 minutes long, so you know that it's gonna roughly be so many bars at this tempo, and that's probably as mathematical as it will get. Um, but I'm not crunching any sort of technical aspect other than okay. that. The creative stuff always comes first. Yeah, awesome. absolutely. Yeah. Are there any games you want to get your hands on? Like any franchises where to you play want or to make work the soundtrack? On, you mean? Yeah. Oh, um, I'd love to work on a Mortal Kombat game. Really? I think that'd be really fun. Yeah. Okay. I think I'd, I really, I've always been a big fan of this. I was talking about this earlier actually. I was thinking about like, Doom's such an interesting one because I was trying to think of any other game that came out in 1993 whose developer is still making versions of that game. There's not many. Don't look at me. I can't <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I mean, there might be games from that time that are still being made. The Sonic, the Sprite, Mario, exactly. But the teams are totally different, right? Whereas this is still in software doing that. And Mortal Kombat's the same. It's still Ed Boon behind that. You know? And that's pretty special. Uh, but yeah, I'd love to do that. I'd love to do more uh, story-based stuff, more interesting stuff. Um, I just love the difference of all sorts of different things. Doom is fun, don't get me wrong, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's you know, like one, one sort of meal as well, you know, and, and uh, when you're working creatively in music or in any art form, you really want as many flavors as possible, you know? Okay, yeah. for sure. Mm. Are there any, like, genres or areas of music you wouldn't feel confident or comfortable I mean, the, the beauty about music is it's, it's all the same. So whether that note is being played on the guitar or whether that note is being played on a violin or whether that note's being screamed by a metal choir or whatever, it's all the same note, okay. right? So it's just a different expression of that. I don't even think about music in genre, in terms of genre. I know that certain sounds illustrate a certain genre in people's minds, a distorted guitar is instantly going to summarize certain feelings to somebody just as much as a brass section is, just as much as a taiko drum is, for example, you know? So there's tools that you can use to illustrate certain feelings if you want, but I don't, I don't even really think about it as genre, to be honest, yeah. So I didn't think of it as a concept. Okay, that's yeah. probably very freeing for you. Yeah, we don't sit down and go, let's write rock music for this, or let's write whatever, a, a trap track for this, or whatever, we don't, I don't. We never look at it like that, yeah. Do you get asked to work on film like these days and do you want to? I'd love to do film. I think what I'd love more than film is, is a series. I think that would be incredible. I mean, like, film is one thing. Sure. Why a series? Imagine 10 hours, you know, of, of content to be able to build character themes, for example. Okay. Like, the, the journey that you can take an audience over 10 hours, so in a series, for example, 10 episodes, one hour each is what I'm saying. Um, that's 10 times they're going to hear the theme. That's 10 times they might, you know, experience a certain flow and, and dynamics of the characters that can change. And that's just something you can't even reach with a, with a film, for example. Yeah, um, so. We've talked about doing films in the past. We've come close to doing a couple of films and things like that. Um, often it doesn't work out for really good reasons. It's just not, not suited. Sometimes it doesn't gel. Um, 
you can like I mean the honest truth about a lot of this stuff is that these are the commitments you know it can be 18 months two years of your life that you're gonna pour into something yeah so how much do things change in two years like think two years ago right so in 2017 like the world was a different place then you know what I mean and there was music that I was writing for Doom Eternal then that still has to sit next to the music that I'm going to write tomorrow on the project. Um, and it's a commitment, these things, yeah. Sorry, this is a big answer to your question. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So you're still working on Doom Eternal soundtrack now? I'm not meant to be, but yeah. I'm curious, how into a project do you get? Like, do you change your environment oh, to yeah. reflect? <laughs> Can you give me an example of this? Like you drawing yes. pentagrams on the roof and killing goats yeah, and stuff to get I into mean, Doom? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know what it is for me personally, but I find that I, I can't really get into something unless I'm all in. I have a real obsessive personality, uh, and so for me, it is definitely all in. So with Doom, it's it's all lights off, it's candles lit, it's smoke, it's incense burning. Um, I, I surround myself with books that are kind of weird and like occult stuff. Yeah, occult stuff, paganism books. Um, Books that are hard to get of, of, you know, deathly things and morbid things, lots of morbid curiosities. Um, I have a human leg bone flute that's sitting above um, where I'm working. Um, yeah, it's, it's proper all into it, yeah. And I find like to get these, these things, it's that great John Cleese thing, right? Is that to, to, to achieve anything creative, you need two things, it's time and space. And once you get those two things, time and space, um, you can achieve anything, really. And for me, if I fully immerse myself into that world with time and space, so this is no distractions, it's all lights off, there's no communication, that's when you can finally channel the music. And at that point, weirdly, and I don't mean to sound pretentious, it's going to sound pretentious, but I feel at that stage it's like musical archaeology. So the music's already written, right? It's already there, it already exists. It's just kind of my job to, to uncover it in a way. I mean, it's hard to explain, but that's kind of how it feels. If you did that for Doom, what did you do for something like Wolfenstein? How do you change your environment to reflect? Yeah, so I mean, that's, that's a... yeah. I mean, Wolfenstein is an interesting one because the the story is what really brings that game yeah. across. So it's not just the oppression of the Nazi regime in that game and the alternative timeline and things like that. It's the story of humanity just coming back together, and that's through the characters. So it's not. I'm not surrounding myself with the stuff about the Nazis, I'm surrounding myself with the, the, the small essences of humanity that are just being brought back together by the resistance in that game. That's where the story is there. So they're fighting Nazis for sure, but the, the goal of that is to stitch back humanity. Yeah. It's probably hard to answer, but what's the most challenging project you've worked on? Oh man, they're all challenging for different reasons. Is there I one think? where you're like, that nearly killed me? <laughs> uh, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> There's, I think, I mean, look, these endeavors are huge. As I said, Doom Eternal at this point has been two years. Uh, was I, Doom 18 months, the original about one? About 18 months, okay. yeah, yeah. And when you're into it, it's all in. And what I mean by all in is that I'm finishing like midnight and I'm trying to crash out and then I'm back in there like six in the morning. It's four, five, six hours sleep. Yeah have a small break for lunch, maybe try and do some exercise during the day, and that's it. And that's seven days a week, and that can be for a year. And then you have the occasional day off where you, you know, try and re, I don't know, kindle relationships with the wife, for example, and dogs and things like that, right? So these are a huge commitment, right? And that comes with all sorts of challenges, really. Um, and every single project has different challenges. These challenges can be ones of time, so um, the schedule can be so tight that this thing needs to get done. So you just have to do whatever you can to get mm -hmm. that thing I've done. done those crunch sure, you know what it's four like. days a week. Sure. Those ones. <laughs> yeah, awake for four days. Yeah. Um, so there's that sort of thing. It can be uh, sort of budgetary things. Like you might want to do these amazing things, but you just can't. There's no no budget and things for it there. Um, any of those sorts of yeah, standard okay, things. I get what yeah. You're saying, yeah. Mm, yeah, for sure. What do you require from a gaming developer to get? an understanding for the sound the game requires. Like, yeah. going from being hired to creating a sound that fits something, I can't like wrap my head around that concept. Yeah. Um, I find it's, it's usually a two-pronged thing. So, number one is I'm trying to understand the game, and number two, I'm trying to understand the team. You know? Okay. So the first thing is understanding the game. What's the game about? What's the motivations of the game? What's the feelings that we want the player to, to have? Is it a, 
exciting experience? Is it threatening? Is it violent? Is it excessive? All these sorts of things. These are high level, right? Once we would de determine them, then it's on a more of a subtle sort of level. So uh, I try to basically take this entire massive project and whittle it down to a single concept. That's the most important thing for me. So with Doom, for example, it's a horror game where you play the serial killer. So you are the, it's like the demons have made a horror movie about you. Yeah, you know, this yeah. is the horrible thing that could come into hell and kill us all at any moment. That's, that's the concept, right? And so musically, that's the approach. And then once you've got that, you can kind of take every creative decision that you might be faced with and see how it measures against that core concept. And if it measures well, then it's a good idea. If it doesn't measure well, then it's a bad idea and you can throw that, right? So that's the first step. The second step is understanding the team. What's the team's tastes? Who are they? What are they like? What stage are they are in their lives? What's going on? What have they done in the past? What's their goals with this project? What are they trying to achieve themselves? And the reason I do that is so when that person looks at me and says, I need this to feel more like a, like a, you know, Thursday morning hangover after being out late, too late or whatever. You and know them enough to know I know them mean. to know that like what that actually means yeah. versus somebody else saying that same thing. Talking about creative stuff is really, really tricky. We're trying to use this incredibly restrictive method of communication called the English language to illustrate things that are so greater than language, which is the art form, right? And the language itself is never gonna get there the same way, right? So for different people, everybody's gonna speak about it in a different way. So understanding them on a personal level is helpful in that regard, yeah. So do you go to a studio and spend a lot of time with them? Oh yeah, that's, uh, I feel that's integral, yeah. I try to make several visits throughout a project, yeah. So yeah, absolutely. Mm. Praise soundtrack was pretty obscure yeah, and sure. abstract. How did you channel that vibe? Prague was an interesting one because the development itself um, was done in sort of segments. So uh, they would come along and say, hey, we need a couple of pieces of music. And then I wouldn't hear from them for six months. And then six months later, they come back in and they say, hey, now we need something for this and this and that. Hmm. And I do that. And then six months later, the same thing would happen. And so Prey itself was done over a long period while I was doing Doom and Wolfenstein. I think even a little bit of Killer Instinct at the time as well. It was still at that stage. Um, so musically, um, that was only able to kind of be pulled off because of Raf, the creative director um, of the studio, and he was creative director on the project. Um, he was really great at giving concepts. So he would say, I want this to feel like a Western in space. You know what I mean? Like a, or, or Western with um, like Moog synthesizers, for example. He's a musician himself, so he could, he, we could bypass all of that personality stuff, and he could say very literally about like, what he needs. Um, He's also half French and half Italian, so creativity in, is, in, is, is in his blood, right? Great food and creativity is what he has, you know? Um, and he would understand and respect that I think you are trying to channel an art form as well. So he'd speak to you very respectively on the level of an artist, and he'd use, use language that you as an artist want to hear, with concepts, for example. That means speaking through concepts. He would never literally say, I want this in D minor or 86 be beats per minute or anything like that. But he'd talk about like how you might go about doing it, and the feeling that you want to get from that piece of music. Interesting. And so yeah, that was really, really easy from that. Is that uncommon to have that? Yeah, it's, well, I mean, everybody's different. Getting studio? Everybody's different. Everybody's gonna communicate it in a different way. Um, so he was very unique. Yeah, cool. Yeah. When you got asked to do Doom. Yes. I mean, Doom's got such a massive legacy. Was that stressful and scary or exciting? Yeah. Like an exciting challenge or a mixture of everything? Um, I think I'd, I'd been prepped pretty well because I'd had the really great, you know, privilege and honor to, um, you know, be part of Killer Instinct coming back and then be part of Wolfenstein coming back. So when it was, Doom, I'd already been through the ringer a few times. Yeah, it was your yeah. thing, Resurrection. I don't know about that, but it's more like, I'd been through those mistakes already on a couple of other things and learned those experiences on those projects, yeah. But the honest truth again with this one is that you try to ignore the name that's attached to it. With a name like Doom, it carries so much weight. And if all you're doing is staring at that elephant in the room, you're not gonna see everything else. And as difficult as it is, and as sacrilege as it might feel, you have to put that aside 
to be able to do the job and then bring it back afterwards. Um, doing Doom in 2016 is very different to doing Doom in 1993. Tastes are different, technology is different, the game experience is different. Um, I mean, the gap between all that, with the games that have come out between that, whether it's a Battlefield, a Call of Duty, a Half-Life, I mean, all, all sorts of things that happen in between that, Minecraft, uh, and then here comes Doom again. So you have to reinterpret with modern eyes, right? Once you're in that headspace, then you can dip back into that franchise and bring certain things back. The beauty about Doom and what's really important to mention here in this moment, I think, is that Doom only su survives because of the fan base. So it's not that they've just looked into their catalog and went, oh, you know, we haven't done anything in Doom for a while. It's the fans that have kept that alive. And it would be a grand injustice to wrong them by not honoring that legacy. So at the same time, it's obvious that you have to play, pay homage to the history that comes before. I feel with these things, it's a giant like train that's moving. And I just happen to be fortunate enough to step on that train for a little bit. You know, that's it. And that's as far as I think. It's not mine. I don't own any of it. That's the fans. They're the ones that interpret it that way. So you didn't... It sounds like you took it in your stride rather than being like, oh my God, this oh, is scary. This is it's scary. scary. Yeah, it's scary for sure. Yeah, it's, I'm not going to lie, it's not scary, yeah. But then at the same time too, I think it would be an injustice to walk into the project and, and say, I'm not scared. I know exactly what to do. Yeah, for sure. Like it's racked with self-confidence issues the entire time. And trust me, having it work out well once means nothing for the second one around. <laughs> it's just as nerve wracking. <laughs> Don't say that. Probably worse, actually, yeah. Well, it's the honest truth. I mean, yeah, I know. you know, whatever. <laughs> I mean, when we sit down to do this sort of thing, you never know where it's going to go. You have no idea. Your intention and your goal is to do your very best because that's what they're hiring you to do. That's what you owe the franchise. You just do your best. Whether it turns into a success or not, that's not up to you. That's the fans. You've done the best job you could regardless. It's up to the fans whether it's a success or not. Speaking of the fans, something they want to know, what's your favorite track from Doom soundtrack? Which Doom soundtrack? Your one. Oh, I wouldn't even answer Come that on. question, man. Do you want to be honest? Anyone honest? Yeah. I haven't listened to it since it came out. Really? Yeah. I had to... We had to pull stems out for some performances that we did. Yep. And I had to listen to it then. Um, and recently I've kind of gone back through to see how certain levels, you know, what sound worked in this level and things like that. But no, I don't. If you look at my Spotify list, it's not on there. This uh, might be I'm easy then. Yeah. What's your favorite demon from Doom? Oh, Revenant, easy, yeah. Really? Yeah, easy. Okay. Yeah, just, yeah. I feel like it's such an id software design. You know, like a giant skeleton demon with rocket launches yeah. and a jetpack. Like that's so id software to Did me. you see the skin they're releasing in Doom Eternal? Oh, yeah, of course. Have a, I know all that stuff. <laughs> you serious? I'm working on the damn thing. Of course I've seen it. <laughs> What's the lowest tuning that was used in Doom soundtrack? See, I've, I've explored a lot on how to get low. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> terrible. It, there is a point when you get so low that you're a percussive element. You know, you're a percussive instrument now. You're now a kick drum. You're that low. Um, but what's really cool, sometimes I've done that. We've just taken the guitar and, and tuned every single string down to as low as it's going to be. So the strings are just like flopping like this. And then that, when it's played, is kind of like, you know, got cool aspects to it as well. Um, Chad, uh, when I, the singer from Frontera, he uh, was part of the metal choir. And I feel they do such an incredible job of like incredibly down low tune stuff, but still makes it work really well. Um, so there's definitely a limit and it's a physical limit. There's just that like you go so low that only elephants are going to pay attention to it, right? You can go so low where you can actually see the speakers moving. The cycles are so low that you can actually count the cycles per second. Oh wow. You know what I mean? So it's, there's no point going down to that. I find personally, once I get down to like D, you can't really go lower than that and still get those lovely sub-frequencies. Sub-frequencies at C-sharp don't really resonate for our speakers that well. You're talking like 30, whatever it is, 31 hertz or something like that. And are we talking like 14 semitones below a standard tuning? Which D are we talking about? Oh, so... Oh my gosh, I wouldn't... <laughs> Which well, depends, so you've got drop D. Yeah. Doom 2016 is in lower. an octave lower yeah, than okay. that. If you take that an octave lower, you can still make that work just. An octave lower than that is kind of like sub-frequency. And that's when I'm using synthesizers to do that because a physical instrument just falls apart at that stage. Lower than that, you just, 
it just disappears. Yeah. yeah. The nine string you bought and yes. used for Doom soundtrack. You said you gave it to a friend of yours in a metal band. Yeah. Can you say who? Oh that yeah, was it's Frederick or... from a Sugar. Oh sick. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And did you get it back? Oh no. Doom Eternal no, soundtrack. No, that's his now. Yeah. No, that's his soundtrack. Did man. you get another nine string? No, no. I um I have a wonderful relationship with Manus Guitars. You got a fourteen string. No, the... no, 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 no. No, I have an eight string that they built me, and I have a seven string, a new one that they built me for this one. Yeah. yeah. Um. We could have done that. There was talk of like, oh, we've done a nine string, let's go for a 10 string. But it's like, musically, what does that mean? And it means that you're turning into a novelty at that point, you know? And nobody's impressed by a nine string guitar. It's what you do with that thing, right? Yeah, How sure. it illustrates that sort of stuff. And adding more strings isn't gonna change that, you know? So, um, yeah, so, no, Frederick has that, man, that's his thing. Yeah. Um, have you approached Doom Eternal soundtrack differently? I watched one of your talks and you talked about if you want to change the outcome, change the process. Sure. Did you come at Doom Eternal soundtrack with the same process because it worked so well last time? Or have you come at it totally differently? Um, I'll probably talk around that one uh, yeah. a little bit, but I can give you a general answer because yeah. I've done, you know, sure. Wolfenstein sequels, Killer Instinct season two and things like that. Honestly, each project you approach with fresh eyes, fresh ears. Um, I'm a big fan of like you take whatever you've done and you hit delete and then you, you relearn that entire project again. And when doing a sequel, of course you're going to end up in a very similar space because you're working with the same team, it's a similar project, it's a follow up. So we are, by nature, you're gonna end up in a, in a new space. But if you're coming from a fresh approach, you'll reach new things that you maybe didn't reach before because you yourself have grown as a human being. You, you have learned a lot more, the world has changed, you've got different ideas, um, you've, you've learned things and you've, in the past that you've gotten bored with and you want to do new things now. Um, so that's generally the approach, a fresh approach for every project is really important. Yeah. You can't just grab what you did last time and you know, hit copy paste and then be done with it. Yeah, it's got to be a new thing. You probably can't answer this either, <laughs> but <laughs> given you like met I've played a lot of the, 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 the demo for Doom Eternal, I've played a lot Ooh, of it. Yeah, and the it's like it made uh, 2016's Doom feel like a tutorial level. Like they've upped the ante so much. How oh, the Eternal? Yeah, Doom, Doom Eternal. Oh, the I demo. thought you were talking about the Doom 2016 demo. Uh, Doom You've Eternal's actually played? Demo. Yeah, a lot. Wow, where did you play it? Uh, Gamescom, Quake Con. Holy shit! E3, PAX, Australia. Cool. Yeah, but anyway, like that how- That was cool. That's only like a quarter of the level, you know that, right? Yeah, that I know. That's huge. That's what I'm saying, it makes, even that alone makes 2016 feel like a tutorial level. Like it's, yeah. it's they went from 11 to 666, like it's so crazy. <laughs> and I want to know, I like how, how have you matched that? Sonically? Yeah, so uh, that was the second level we tackled. Uh, and I tackled that probably about 18 months ago, that level. It's called Mars Core. And um, that one's fun because Hugo sent me a cutscene of the Doom Slayer walking through a facility that is occupied by human beings. We've never seen this in a Doom game before. This is totally new, right? And the entrance to this, I thought was inspired by a Stanley Kubrick film which was, what is the World War II film? No, World War I film he did, it's in black and white. And there's a wonderful scene in that where the soldier is walking through a trench and they're all sort of looking up at him as, as to what's going on. I thought it was inspired by that. Of course it's Hugo, so it's inspired by Universal Soldier instead, right? <laughs> anyway, um, so anyway, so this thing starts with this great narrative sequence where all these people are around the Doom Slayer and just absolutely freaking out. And that really sets the mood, you know, that there's this entire team of human beings that are trying to sort out this grand catastrophe. And he's walking in saying, don't worry about it, I've got it, you know, I'm gonna sort it out for you guys. So that little hinge point is what sort of set that whole level. Um, everything that happens after that is, is uh, it's a grand epic, that whole level in itself. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know, I can't really say much more than that, to be honest. Have yeah. you worked with any notable metal musicians or musicians in general in Doom Eternal? Oh, you, don't yeah. know, you don't have to name them. Yeah, yeah. sure. Oh, look, the metal choir that we recorded back in Austin, um, that whole thing was made with, of metal stars, man. That whole thing, we had 24 people in that. Um, half male, half female, which is incredible. And uh, do we have people come out from Belgium for that? We have people come across the country, obviously, for that. Um, that was mind blowing. We have so many amazing people in that choir from bands and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, that's cool. And they were singing like metal vocals. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So for that, that, that required a whole unique approach just in itself, right? We had to write music around what a choir 
would do that, that nobody's ever done before. So for that we really had to kind of envision like what sort of sounds you could get out of a screaming heavy metal choir and then write music around from that. And it was, it's quite fascinating because I've got an A3 score you know, like actual printed score of heavy metal screaming music that's like 40 pages long that we did for it. Um, there's three of them. We had everybody sign it afterwards. One's gone to Bethesda as a gift, one's gone to id Software for their trophy cabinet as a, as a gift, and I've got the third one. Um, but anyway, so yeah, we had to sort of envision as to what textures we could get. And you know that like heavy metal screamers are going to be able to get high, you know they're going to be able to get low. But then it's like, that's, that's one element. What else could we do? What happens if we ask them to be zombies for 30 seconds? What happens if we say that their souls are being extracted by the forces of hell to the point where their physical body is no longer physical, but it is now just a burning husk? What do you sound like? And if you give 24 metal singers that idea, they'll do the rest, you know? Yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking forward to hearing that a lot. <laughs> this might sound a bit personal, but do you have ADHD, dyslexia, synesthesia, any of these oh, things? I think it's bipolar. I think that's what they're diagnosing me with. Yeah, yeah right. I go from like these really super high, excitable moments down, down to like, you know, throwing myself off it's a building. It's so interesting. So, so many like prolific or very interesting musicians often have something like this. You know what it's like. You're like you've got the way you interpret the world and everybody else has their way that they interpret the world. Yeah. Hmm. I'm, I certainly knew from a young age that I was I was looking at things maybe differently to what my friends were and things like that and uh, very obsessive and the, the details that I'd get obsessed over um, other people wouldn't wouldn't even care about you know those sorts of things um, so I noticed that no music for me was a, a great one because uh, when you're learning music there's so much to learn there's so many scales and chords and the way those things all relate to each other and I feel like for me, I'm doing it so much more for selfish reasons myself, is each project is a, like a learning. It's another thing that I can pour the, the energy into, in a way. Yeah, sick. Um, yeah, but, uh, but yeah, it's, the music is my medication that, that stops uh, anything dire from happening. Yeah, you're lucky yeah. you found it. Sure. And also that you did it so we get the music. Well, in. I mean, there's lots of my buddies that have found it and, and it hadn't paid out for them. I mean, how many high profile, you know, people have we lost over the last yeah, couple of years, you know, who've poured themselves into music and things. Yeah, I'm, I don't know, man. Life's such a complicated, difficult thing, you know. It's, aren't we all looking for that one thing that we can sort of justify our existence with? Skyrim. Skyrim, Skyrim sure, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you bring up an interesting point too, is that this is the, the sort of great role of, of video games and that this isn't lost on us as well, is that, you know, we're making that thing that somebody, when they knocks off at five o'clock on a Friday afternoon or whatever, is looking forward to going home and decompressing to. They want to just load up Doom and shoot some demons for an hour or whatever. And that's that's an incredible sort of privilege. Yeah, it's really yeah. oddly um, unintentionally powerful. Like, I'll yeah. get comments saying, oh, I wanted to kill myself, but I found you. This Easter eggs, yeah. Like, what? I mean, like, I was, was going to say, true, like, trying to make a cool video. Thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like, people who sit and watch an hour long video that you've spent a long time producing, there's something going on in their lives that they're releasing by watching your video. And that is a great privilege and honor, and it's a responsibility that you have as well for that content, you know. Um, we're all into this, you're the same, you know. It's no different, right? No. Yeah. So we know Doom Eternal's coming up. Yes. Are there any other projects in the future that you can talk about or that we... Nothing I can really talk about, but there's about. a couple of things that I really want to do and really excited about. So the, the first thing I'll jump onto straight away is getting the Doom Eternal soundtrack wrapped up. So we finished the game score and then the big job is like taking that game score and turning it into a linear listening experience, which is the soundtrack. I love that process. I'm always so disappointed when a game soundtrack is just like the loops from the game and there's like 400 loops that they just throw on a Spotify player. That's another thing. To me, I want to I'm gonna build my own mini Doom experience in a soundtrack form, right? And um, I love that they gave me the freedom to do that in the last one with the voiceover files and all that sort of stuff, right? So that's the first thing. Um, I really want to, and we're making grand steps to take this stuff on the road and actually cross that barrier between controller and player and screen and actually get people into an audience at a live music performance of stuff. So that's a big thing I want to pull off in 2020. 
Um, and there's, you know, game stuff, source stuff, uh, album stuff, all sorts of things. That's so interesting. I was going to ask you that. Like, do you, I know you used to play in pubs and stuff. Mm, yeah. Do you miss playing live? No. Um, well, <laughs> no. I shouldn't say it that way. I miss, you know, finishing. When I, dude, when I was a teenager, so when I'm 15, right, we I was playing in a blues band, and we did. I'd finish school at three o'clock, four o'clock on a Friday afternoon. I'd go home and change and have a bite to eat, and I'd start my first gig at eight o'clock in the evening, right? We'd play from there to eight, from eight till midnight. We'd finish at midnight, and then we had half an hour to pack up the gear, get across town, and set up for a, a, another four-hour session. It was a blues session that finished about 4 a.m. We did that Friday night and Saturday night, every weekend, and then Sunday afternoon we'd have a, like a slow blues session somewhere. So every weekend when I was a teenager, it was five gigs a weekend. Jeez, so, man. I mean, it was an amazing experience, of course, because when you're 15 and you're in pubs and seeing all the stuff that adults do when they're drunk, right, it's amazing. Um, but you know, those late nights and things sort of catch up with you for a while. Are there any games you actually play in your spare time or are you just so oh, sick of So at the screens? moment it's like 18 hours a day uh, on a project, yeah. it's been crunch time. Um, I try to, when there's a bit of downtime, catch up on things. I'm obviously aware of what's going on, which I out videos, YouTube is obviously great for that, your channel is great for all that sort of oh, stuff. Me. Yeah, of course. Um, so I'm aware of like what's going on um, with games, of course, and we're always paying attention to what's happening. Um, so much stuff that comes out that just blows my mind now. I see so much of it from the game development side, and when I see something like Death Stranding and the the, the facial capture animation stuff, the the technology that was built for the rain system that changes the world and builds buildings and then has a ruins, like Technically, what's happening to pull that stuff off, that's mind-blowing in my, my opinion. Um, so yeah, I'm just constantly blown away, man. You know, like, like what, 10 years ago? It was like a 50-50 chance whether that game that you got was going to be good or not. The amount of crap games that were released then were, mm -hmm. were you know, high. <laughs> Whereas now I feel like anything that you're pretty much made aware of is going to be great, you know? Um, yeah, everything's amazing and nobody's impressed. <laughs> right? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> sure. What's the weirdest instrument you've used? Uh, I have a kangling. It's a human leg bone flute. Uh, it's, it's used for, it's a Tibetan instrument and it's used as like a death flute. Um, and it's made out of a femur yeah. and uh, it has the, uh, the socket joint still on it and there's a hole in the socket joint and the other end is sliced. I think I've seen you pick that up in yeah. one of your interviews. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. and then you, you blow through that. Uh, and it creates a really horrible pitch zone. Uh, actually, I really, I got it for Spinal, for Killer Instinct. Oh, really? Yeah, because like <laughs> skeleton character, right? You gotta have a skeleton bone somewhere in there. That's cool. So yeah, that one's pretty weird. I don't know, there's like, I find these days more it's like conceptually what do you want to explore? So the metal choir thing was that, right? We had a core concept of Doom, you know? And it's, a lot of the time is like, how to make things as metal as you can. And when it came time to like talk about can we get choir elements into Doom? It's like, well, what would be one step closer to Doom than just a choir? And of course, if you can fill a choir full of heavy metal screamers, that, you could argue that's definitely a step closer to being more Doom, right? And I think conceptually that stuff's more interesting than like what a weird instrument is. Like I don't have these weird instruments just for the sake of a weird instrument. I have that instrument because it perfectly suited spinal. The same way we had a Viking metal choir uh, do the do the, the chanting uh, lyrics and things for spinal. Um, the characters, the game, the designers, the developers, they're the ones that influence the direction that we take musically. So any weird idea that we come up with has come about because of the game. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen you talk about your tattoos. Oh, sure. They're pretty prominent. Right, yeah, so um, this, I have Ooh, a one right shirt made this. It. So this is by Loz up in Brisbane. He's a great guy, great tattooist. Um, this is a HR Geiger. Uh, that's exactly piece. what I was gonna There's say. There's actually an alien here. You can just see the alien's claw there. There's an upper claw all the way up here. Yeah, right. But it's also loosely inspired by music. So music to me is like repeating patterns. Yeah, there's guitar strings hereabouts. There's sort of bones that are loose musical notes. It's very subjective in that sort of thing, <laughs> but it means to me. Over here, I actually have a post-apocalyptic Los Angeles Terminator 2 scene uh, that's going on here. And I got this before Terminator movies started going bad. And so it's kind of weird that, that since I got these, we have bad Terminator movies and bad Alien movies now. So maybe I'm the catalyst for destroying these franchises. I don't know. Final question. Shoot. Do you want to grab a beer? I don't drink. Yeah. Oh, really? No, I'm um Do you wanna go grab some water later? Sure, let's grab a kombucha <laughs> or something. Yeah, yeah. Um 
No, I'm proper obsessive personality. So if I like one, I'm like all in. Yeah, you know? 100%. yeah. So I just yeah. So I just that's me with abstain. World of Warcraft. <laughs> Very right, infrequently. Yeah. <laughs> totally. <laughs> all right, which is like, thanks so much. Thank I'm such so a fan of your channel. You know, I love the oh, channel. Awesome. Yeah, such great work you do. It's good to catch yeah. up with you. I mean, you're so busy. Yeah, yeah hard thanks so much for doing this. Literally. I appreciate you guys coming all the way out for Sydney. Oh, not at all. No, I love it for that's sure. Awesome. Yeah. Looking forward to your presentation too. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And do maternal of course. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Looking forward to getting it out. Yeah. <laughs>